So we have four faculty members, your colleagues, here today. Uh, two are associate professors and two are tenured faculty members. And so we thought it would be helpful for each of them to provide some remarks on um, helpful advice that they would give you from their various academic career stages on navigating life and your professional path as a scholar at Harvard. So we're going to start with Gina Kim. Um, Gina Kim is the Gardner Coles Associate Professor of History of Art and Architecture in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. She's trained as an art historian of South and, and Southeast Asia with an emphasis on Buddhist material. Her research and publications explore a wide range of topics from issues of female representation and patronage of art in med medieval South Asia to reappropriation of religious sites and objects in post-colonial contexts of South and Southeast Asia. Gina's first book, Receptacle of the Sacred, Illustrated Manuscripts in the Buddhist Book Cult in South Asia, earned the Bernard Cohen Prize Honorable Mention in 2015. Her second monograph, Garlands of Visions, <coughs> Color, Tantra, and a Material History of Indian Painting, demonstrates how Poti manuscripts transformed Indian painting into a portable media that can transform a vast amount of visual knowledge in color. She's also developing a digital humanities project on color, which will serve as a searchable open database for research on pigments. Gina received her Bachelor of Arts in Archaeology and Art History from Seoul National University, and both an, a master's degree and a PhD in History of Art from the University of Ber California, Berkeley. From her perspective as a, a, an associate professor, Gina will talk about finding resources for scholarship and research, navigating Harvard in your department, managing work and life, and pleasures of being on the faculty at Harvard. <laughs> Um, after Gina uh, provides her remarks, uh, we'll turn to Nicole Mastis, who is an associate professor of healthcare policy at Harvard Medical School and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, where she also serves as the director of NBER's Disability Research Center. Her research studies how the health and disability insurance systems affect individual economic behaviors, such as labor, labor supply and the consumption of medical care. Nicole's work has shown how the federal disability insurance system discourages employment by people with disabilities. She's also examining how population aging affects economic growth and how working conditions affect individuals' ability and desire to sustain employment at older ages. Nicole earned a, ba a Bachelor of Arts in English and Spanish from Wellesley College, a Master's of Public Policy from the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley, and a PhD in Economics also from UC Berkeley. From her perspective as a recently promoted associate professor, Nicole will talk about priority setting and managing your workload and work and life. Then we'll turn to Matthew Weinzerl. Matt Weinzerl is the Joseph and Jacqueline Ebling Professor of Business Administration in the Business, Government, and the International Economy Unit at Harvard Business School. And he's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. His academic research has largely focused on the optimal design of economic policy and the role of government in the economy. His current projects identify and formalize the goals for tax policy that hold sway among the public, political, and economic leaders and leading tax thinkers, and then characterize the implications of using those objectives in the analysis of optimal taxation. Recently, Matt has launched a set of research pro projects focused on the commercialization of the space sector and its economic implications. Matt didn't earn his degrees from Berkeley. However, <laughs> he earned a Bachelor of Arts and a PhD, both in economics from Harvard University. From his vantage point as a recently tenured faculty member, Matt will provide to those who have not spent time at Harvard before advice on what you might want to know about the university when joining the faculty here. And finally, Hopi Hoekstra is the Alexander Agassiz Professor of Zoology, jointly appointed in the Departments of Molecular and Cellular, Cellular, Cellular Biology and Organismic and Evolutionary Biology. She's also an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the Curator of Mammals in the Museum of Comparative Zoology. Hopi also serves on the FAS's Committee on Appointments and Promotions, otherwise known as CAP. As an evolutionary geneticist, Hopi studies the molecular basis of adaptation in wild mice. Her work spans the fields of evolution, behavior, morphology, genetics, genomics, development, and neurobiology. 
She has received many awards for her research and teaching, including the Richard Lounsbury Award from the National Academy of Sciences, election into the National Academy of Sciences, the Fanny Cox Prize for Teaching Excellence, and an appointment to a five-year Harvard College professorship. Alas, hope he does hold a BA in integrative biology from the University of California, Berkeley, <laughs> and a PhD in zoology from the University of Washington. From her vantage point as a tenured faculty member at Harvard, Hopi will talk about resources for teaching and mentoring and managing your workload and life. Gina? All right. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that wonderful introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, and well, I was just introduced. My name is Gina Kim, and I teach uh, history of art. And I'm in history of art and architecture in Arts and Humanities Division in FAS. And, and um, I'm excited to see so many new colleagues in our division, Arts and Humanities, and um, also including one in my own department and in FAS and all other professional schools. And when Judy asked me to be uh, on this new faculty institute, I readily agreed because I found it very helpful when I joined this campus on like five years ago. And uh, also because I got so much help from her office and also all the resources available to her faculty on this campus and I thought I should share. Uh, and so I was speaking about, I just condensed it into three aspects of finding resources for scholarship and research and mainly uh, and maybe a little bit about managing work and life and pleasures of the faculty position at Harvard. So finding resources for scholarship and research, and you will find there is a good amount of administrative support on this front. I'll just speak from being faculty on FAS, that we have the FAS Research Development Office that can help you find funding sources for your projects. So when I was developing this exhibition project on Nepalese Buddhist ritual art, I really needed to find funding to you know, support this project. And I met with folks at the FAS Research Development and they did all this research and came up with all these resources that I could apply internally and externally and they're super helpful and that is in a way time saving for your own uh, research and work that you will do. And I'm sure there are other services campus wide that's available like that. But for me, finding resources for research and scholarship is intimately tied to really navigating Harvard and your department. Because the possibility to tap into the resources, the human resources, the eminent scholars that are now your campus colleagues, and being able to connect with them for new possibilities and you know, sort of research engagements is just enormous. However, in practical terms, as everyone has been talking about, uh, that making connections on Harvard campus takes extra efforts and time, as I think more so than some other campuses. Um, so this is partly because everyone is so busy, they, them being eminent and you know very popular and on demand. And you know we joke about how you will hear your colleagues speak at some other big universities, but not in your own department, because you just don't get to have that kind of chances and they're so busy, and you have to make that extra effort to schedule meetings and coffee and, and lunch. And I was looking back on, so in preparation for this uh, institute, I was looking back on my calendar for fall 2013, and I realized there are just so many meetings, lunch meetings, tea, coffee meetings with all these uh, faculty members in my department and elsewhere, and this is partly thanks to the advice that was given by a senior uh, faculty member on this campus that's, who said, you know, make sure that you meet with your senior members or your member, members of your department and have individual meetings, you really connect with them. And I tried, I didn't get to do all of them in one year because you know, everyone goes on leave and it's just hard. And my list of ha to do, like you know, of having to have lunch with list keeps growing. But um, it is a great chance to introduce yourself and your work and learn about their research and interests. And the unspoken rules for new faculty seems to be that uh, senior colleagues and you know, colleagues who have been here often take you off for a meal or coffee. So you know, it's, it's uh, all for these initial meetings so as a welcome. So it's a free lunch. Uh, so <laughs> always invite yourself <laughs> for a meeting. And I, I mean, I'm happy to take anyone out for lunch or coffee. <laughs> So uh, I will do the same because I've been always given these opportunities. 
And one of the unique aspects of Harvard that was iterated uh, all year is that, and it took a while for me to comprehend actually by heart, is that like how much autonomy and independence each academic department has. And this system really ensures that each academic unit keeps its integrity and really sustain academic excellence while promoting deep scholarship in each field. The downside of this is that it can also be a barrier that blocks connecting with scholars and experts outside your immediate field. And, and you will notice there's no shortage of scholarly events on Harvard campus. When I arrived in, on this campus I, uh, five years ago, uh, a senior scholar and a Cambridge resident said, mentioned to me that Harvard is like a Disneyland for scholarly minds. And I think that's sort of an apt uh, analogy that just there are a number of exciting in, and interesting talks and symposium at any given time. On the other hand, because of this siloed nature of its academic unit, sometimes one does not get to learn about or know about the scholar giving a talk or there's an event that's really crucial to your own research that is happening until the day of or after it's over, which is quite a loss actually. So for example, an uh, eminent Buddhist study scholar was giving a talk um, on campus and I learned about it like two days before the talk and I barely managed to make like parts of that event. But if people in like scholars in Buddhist studies known about my research interest in Sanskrit Buddhist manuscripts and tantric Buddhism, they might have actually alerted me that somebody working on that is coming and I would have actually arranged a meeting in advance when he was just here briefly from Hamburg. So, you know, I'm not about to go out to see him, but if he's here, I might as well have seen him. So my point being, the more people on campus know about your research interests, the better your chances of getting connected with scholarly resources. And you think now you're at Harvard, everyone should know what you're working on. <laughs> that's not the case, and you need to be your own spokesperson, and that's really uh, important. And of course, the campus-wide gatherings that Judy's office provides are really great opportunities to you know, meet and, and connect with scholars uh, working outside your own field. And I also recommend looking up all these institutes, centers that are sort of cognate in your cognitive field. Uh, and making efforts to connect with them, because even just signing up for the event letters or newsletters is actually helpful to know about these events going on, on around the campus, and you can decide to go or not to go, but at least just to actually have an understanding of what goes on around the campus is actually helpful. And I thought I would be part of these groups, but it's not automatic you would be plugged into these existing, existing communities. You really do need to make efforts to be connected to these resources. So in my first year here, I organized a, a, an event for, uh, on Nepal and a, a talk on Southeast Asian art, let's say. And I reached out to South Asia Institute, now named Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute, the executive director basically asking for money. Right? And I really needed funding to sponsor these events. And that actually was the beginning of many collaborative efforts, which culminated in my hosting my field symposium on Harvard campus, which uh, really was a great success. And, and being part of this institute, which actually is kind of a result of this one, uni one Harvard uh, sort of effort, that I can also get plugged into many different networks that I would have not access uh, to. And it, being so part of uh, being plugged into these networks are really important doing research in South Asia. I don't know how many of you actually do research outside the US, but if you actually have to go somewhere and do research, you really do need connections. And it really serves to have these kind of uh, connections uh, well established. And of course, Harvard name does carry weight when representing serious research, so you do get a lot more access. There is no doubt about that, but having these connections that are really concrete that can introduce you to these people can actually open archives and reserve collections that would never be, have been accessible. And of course, the Middle Institute being part of this one Harvard uh, motto that I get to actually meet people from Kennedy School, public health, business school, medical school, GSD, School of Education, so it's a great sort of uh, milieu where I can actually talk to people and, and learn about their exciting projects. And in fact, in fact, given this 
sort of opportunity of having all these scholars from different schools, I will actually shamelessly sort of plug in my project on this digital humanities project on mapping color in history because I'm discovering this is really trying to create an online database that is searchable on historical and scientific information on pigments in these paintings. And I'm discovering this is so hard to deal with not having any background on data science or statistics. And I'm he I heard a lot of data science and statistics in the crowd. <laughs> Any expert, I would love to talk to you <laughs> afterwards. So just making these kind of connections and uh, finding centers that you can, uh, hubs that can actually connect you through these different nodal points, I think, are really important. And you need to make that uh, effort. So my basic attitude in advancing scholarship and research is really to ask to ask and to ask, shamelessly ask. And uh, whether it's for funding or any other connections you need, and there's, you'll find an answer. I'll talk a little bit about managing work and life from the perspective of a um, working mother of a 10-year-old boy who constantly sort of suspects that his mother loves his, her work more than him. Hmm. <laughs> and, um, I arrive on this campus with a five-year-old son, and my husband works in New York, so that so it presents a challenging situation for childcare. And the childcare funding supports that come from Judy's office and also FAS has uh, funding support, and these are all very helpful. And I did use like the dependent care fund to travel internationally to give talks, and I had to take my child with me, and that was a great support. And I have to say, as much as my 10-year-old uh, likes to give me a hard time by saying, you know, you love your work more than you do, uh, you love me, <clears throat> but he uh, loves being part of my work and research, I have to say, and he, uh, from the tender age of four, he said he would be my research assistant. <laughs> <laughs> and help mommy. And finally, on the pleasure of being on Harvard faculty, and in addition to these incredible resources and scholarly you know, assets, I'd say working with these exceptional students are just you know, phenomenon. It, it is pheno phenomenal to be working with these exceptional students. Um, when I taught a freshman seminar on, in one fall, I was just so stunned by the, the amount of, and quality of the work that freshmen produced. And the, this sort of leads to the last tip I will share here, which my department our colleague, Jennifer Roberts, shared with us at, the, at my new faculty institute, which is to say you should design your courses to advance your research and don't try to teach a new course every year because it will take a while to figure out the demographic and the needs of, the cor uh, of any course. And I think other panels would touch upon the work-life balance and sort of managing your time, but I'd like to add that it takes really discipline to be protective of your research and writing time. And as much as I emphasize reaching out, collaborating, being part of an active, like, active member of the community, at the end of the day, your scholarly contribution does require a lot of these sol solitary moment, moments, and this really requires discipline. So thank you. Hello, um, so I'm Nicole. I'm an economist at Harvard Medical School. I've been here for about three years and I came um, as an associate professor. Um, so I have six pieces of advice for you um, based on my experience of being new. Um, and I kind of marvel at this because I still feel new. Um, and maybe I, maybe I am compared to uh, many others here, but um, here goes. Okay, so, and some of these are gonna echo things you'll hear from others or that you have heard so far. But my first very important one is simply meet people. Now, this is why many of us are here. We came to Harvard because of the people. It's an incredible place filled with incredible people. And believe me, it is layers deep in terms of opportunity, experience, potential collaborators. It's like an onion. It will take you years to kind of unpeel that onion. Um, but you know, now is really the only time you'll ever be a new professor at Harvard. It goes so fast. It's gone in a flash. Next thing you know, you're sitting on a panel like this. <laughs> <laughs> and trust me, you'll be uh, far too busy then to invest the kind of time you could put now into meeting pe people later on. Um, but I promise you, if you invest early, it will pay dividends down the line. 
make a list of names, work your list. If you're an introvert, just force yourself to do it, calendar it, schedule those meetings, invite someone for lunch. And the important thing to realize is that people actually expect to hear from you. They really do. And if you don't reach out, they might wonder why. Just do it. For me, it was important that I met other economists, economists at the other schools. I also work a bit in the field of aging. It was important to meet other non-economists working on aging across the schools, and there are so many of them. But again, not just within your discipline, but across schools and across other disciplines. I recommend the events held by the university, held by Judy's office, um, held by Radcliffe, by all the other various centers around here. These are great ways to meet people that you otherwise wouldn't naturally meet. I figure that if I've met one new person and had an authentic interaction with that person at an event like that, that it was a good use of my time. And just to give you an example, I attended since I'm over, I, my office is in the Longwood campus, but since I was here today, I went to an event at the Harvard Kennedy School and met my one person. He was a senior faculty member that I had admired for a long time in the sociology department, um, and I had my chance. Um, wouldn't have happened if I hadn't just shown up. Um, side tip, flights out of Boston to just about anywhere, but especially DC, are loaded with Harvard faculty. <laughs> <laughs> I have had some of my best interactions just by talking to the person next to me on a flight out of Boston. Um, so anyway, it's a very efficient way to meet somebody. Um, now, people often say that it takes too much time to get to events. Um, and it is true, it can take um, a bit of time. But you need to kind of recognize that up front and just work around it. Um, as I mentioned, my office is in Longwood. Um, a short time after I arrived here, someone offered me a desk in Cambridge. In fact, I had multiple offices for, for desks in Cambridge. Um, so if they come, grab them. I jumped on this offer, and um, I now have a place to sit. I sat there today knowing that I wanted to be here for this event today. Um, but it just makes it easier to meet with anybody. It reduces the time costs, and that's what you're really looking for is a way to kind of reduce those travel and time costs. I have faculty members, maybe they don't, uh, faculty colleagues, they might not have an office to sit at, um, but they have their spot. It's a special cafe in Cambridge or a place in the library, and that'll be where they go and kind of, you know, actually it's kind of nice. You get some, some kind of quiet time and a change of scene um, for a day to enable you to do some of the things um, on a different, in a different part of campus. Um, okay, I promise the rest won't be quite as long as that. Um, number two, figure out what are the most important things for you to accomplish in your new role, okay? Now, no matter what level you're at in the academic ladder, there's always a next step on that trajectory for you. And even for two people at the same spot, that next step might be, um, might be different. Figure it out early, and figure it out by talking to the people who will actually make decisions about whether or not you're kind of fulfilling those goals. Um, but even more important than that, figure out where you are relative to the goal. So early on, I heard from my other associate professor colleagues in the medical school that it was very important to um, demonstrate international influence for promotion. And I observed them traveling all around and giving international talks. So I went hog wild and lined up a bunch of international talks and spent a lot of time on airplanes going and giving talks. It wasn't clear to me that I'd kind of already done enough of that until my chair said to me, why are you traveling so much? <laughs> so the point just being that what's right for somebody is not necessarily the thing that you needed. In my instance, I had kind of taken care of that. That was, that was in good shape, and that time was better put on something else, okay? Number three, once you find out what the most important things are for you, make those things sacrosanct, okay? For me, it's, it's about protecting time to do the things that feed into those most important things. So for me and for, for many of us, Writing time is really the thing, right? So for me, I write in the mornings, and I do not take meetings in the mornings unless I absolutely have to. It's just a rule. I have an assistant who schedules my meetings with all my colleagues and project staff and the like, and everybody knows that I don't take meetings in the mornings because that's when I write, okay? And it's just, it's arbitrary, but it works. The other thing to recognize about that, though, is that often things sort of change over time. And I used to work and live on um, the West Coast. 
So my writing time was in the afternoon because I needed to talk to people on the East Coast in the mornings. Okay, so be flexible, but figure it out. So number four, optimize your schedule for you. Okay, we're all different, but you need to figure out how you're gonna do your best work and when you do your best work. I find that how I start my day determines how the rest of the day goes. Okay, if I start out focused, writing a paper, then I tend to do more writing that day. But if I start my day answering emails, I tend to get caught up in the administrative stuff and I spend less time writing that day. Okay, I also wind up kind of frittering away the time of day that's most productive for me. Now, I used to be most productive like after 10 p.m. That's no longer the case, right? For me, my most productive time is, is first thing in the morning. Um, another small thing, but if I drive to work, I find I arrive tired. If I take the train, I arrive more awake because I've had to walk 15 minutes to get from the station to my office. These small details can make a really big difference in how you start the day and that really sets you on um, a trajectory. Um, and it's important to recognize those, those small things that can make that difference. Okay, number five, find your boundaries. Many of us experienced an exponential increase in invitations and opportunities after arriving at Harvard. For me, it was absolutely overwhelming at times. As just one example, and it's a small one, but I began getting so many requests for referee reports from journals, for grant review committees, letters for people who were up for promotion, that I felt that if I accepted all of them, I could spend all my time commenting on other people's work instead of actually doing my work. So it goes without saying that you need to figure out when to say no, okay? Something has to give, and you have to recognize that really early. Um, if it's something you should do, and it's often good to get advice from the people who know what really matters for you, back to item number two on the list. Um, if, if, if it's something you really should do, then you ask yourself, okay, what am I gonna cross off my list in order to make room for that? It's really important to do that because many of us just acquire more and more service activities as life goes on without actually letting go of things that we've already done, that we've already mastered. Um, and another thing is that many people think that you have to give an explanation when you say no to an activity. But really you don't. You just say no. Nobody really cares. They don't need to hear why. Mostly they just want a timely no so they can move on to the next person and there is always a next person. Make time to keep yourself happy and healthy. Um, this job isn't everything in life. Self-care matters, and it matters an incredible amount. You have to exercise, you have to sleep, your family matters, your friends matter. In my, in, in my case, I found that moving here from another place, before this I lived in Los Angeles, I arrived here without friends. And I still to this day am working on finding friends in this new city. Um, but it, it takes a lot of effort um, when you're very busy with, um, I have three kids and, um, and this job and the like. Um, but you know, these sorts of things are um, really essential for sustaining a good pace over a long horizon, okay? So, um, uh, with that, I will leave you with parting words, which are, um, above all, don't be too serious about things and just have fun. <laughs> Hello, I'm Matt, I'm at the business school, and we speak, we teach very interactively, so I have to be able to see all of you. It's just a bug in the system. Okay, so we have a, um, a colleague from the philosophy department, so I have a question to ask Samantha, I believe, right? So why did the dolphin join the philosophy department when she came to Harvard University? To discover her porpoise in life. Okay, very good, that was terrible, come on, people. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. Don't take yourself too seriously. Did you hear Nicole's last piece of advice? All right. So I have, um, I'm not really sure why exactly I was invited here um, to give you my thoughts, although I have been here quite a while. So I came here from Minnesota where I grew up when I was uh, 18 for undergrad. That was 96. Uh, a couple years in New York and a year in DC in between, but otherwise I was here for grad school too. So I've been at Harvard literally half of my life which is kind of an amazing thing. And so even though it's still just one perspective, at least it's a perspective I've kind of evolved over time. So that's what I'm hoping to give you are some thoughts about how this place feels uh, to someone who's been here for a while. 
And as our colleagues were talking, I kept writing more things I wanted to tell you. So I'm going to try to go fast so that I don't go over my time. But the first thing is, um, I was the only one who wasn't asked to speak about work and life balance, but I'm going to anyway. Um, and I would say, the most important thing I would say about balancing work and life is balance your work and life. Uh, actually do it. It's important. I, I actually don't think it's as much of a trade-off as your instinct is telling you it is, right? I think the more you balance your family or your friends with your work, the more creative you are, the broader a thinker you are, probably the happier and healthier you are. And so even though, of course, you will feel bad if you don't get tenure, and you'll wonder, like, if I just spent more sleepless nights in the office, I think you'll feel even worse if you do get tenure and you, like, don't know your spouse or your kids. And I think that's an even worse outcome. So just remember that as you're going along. And, and I have to say, I'm not just saying this for a self-serving reason, but I actually also have to leave at 4.45 to go pick up my daughter. So please forgive me for doing that. Okay, now my three things that I had prepared before, though, the first one, um, thoughts about Harvard University. I'm not sure it's a particularly friendly thought, so um, brace yourselves a little bit. I would say that I think Harvard expects you to define yourself, and that can sometimes be hard. So I want to give you a little example. Uh, five years ago or so, I got promoted to associate, which is, of course, without tenure. And so I met with our department head to sort of debrief. And this should be a happy occasion, right? Like, congratulations, all this stuff. It was not. So um, he was a very senior macroeconomist. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Um, and he sat me down and he said, so Matt, here's how I see it. You've chosen to play in a subfield of economics that has attracted many of their highest IQ people in the field. You're not going to win in that field. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was sobering because, of course, implicitly he's saying something about my IQ, right? We all got that, we all got that part. Um, but also, look, I've just been promoted to associate, which means I have four years, basically, three till a packet goes in until to like make tenure, right? And it was, it was hard at first, but then I, as I look back on it, I think it was some of the best advice I got because first of all, it was right, like the, the fact part of it um, <laughs> about the IQ. But more importantly, it forced me to say, what can I do? In economists speak, what's my comparative advantage? What can I actually do at this place that will earn me tenure in a few years? What do I bring to the table? And Harvard, as loving as it is, and Judy's office, to be clear, I've been here a while, has made big strides in making it a more of a supportive community. It isn't exactly the hand-holding place, right? This is a place of ambition, it's a place with a lot of hard-driving people, and the place expects you to be one of those people. So find your path and, and chart it. Uh, and so I think that's important. The, the one little caveat I would make to that, which I actually thought of when Larry was talking, was at my grad school orientation, President Faust gave a speech, and she said, at some point during grad school, each of you will feel like you don't belong here, like you're a failure, like somehow it was a mistake that they let you in. And I was like, that's not going to happen to me, right? I totally <laughs> belong here. And then two years into grad school, I had exactly that feeling, right? I felt like, oh my gosh, what am, I'm not going to make it. I started calling hedge funds to see if they'd give me a job on Wall Street. Um, and so I went through that moment. And I would guess that that will happen to a lot of us as junior faculty, a lot of you as junior faculty too. It certainly happened to me, where you wonder, how's this going to work out? And all I would say is know that that does happen to a lot of people who are here as junior faculty. And it's okay. And you, will, you can make it through. You're here for a reason. It's not a mistake. You got hired. Okay. The second thing I will go very quickly, which is because everyone's covered this already. This is a big place. That can be a challenge. But of course, the economies of scale are incredible. I'm interested in the commercialization of space. The minute I started talking about that, people from all over the university popped up who were interested in this. And I think that's not an accident. We're all interested, we're all looking for the big stuff, right? Stuff that's gonna matter. And so when you find one of those things, other people have probably found it too. So raise your hand and you'll meet people who can help you do, partner with that. Okay, so the last thing, which um, again, I think is a little more controversial maybe, but I'll, I'll say it. Um, so the university works in what sometimes can seem like very mysterious ways. <laughs> Um, and you'll be tempted to wonder about that. But I would, I would urge you to think that it deserves your help and your trust. Okay? So the trust in particular, I think, is going to be the key word for me. So, you know, look, as I've been here as an undergrad and then grad student and assistant professor and, and so on, at each point you're tempted to think that person above you is making some crazy mistake, right? Like a terrible decision. Why would they do that? 
and I've no, of course, you know, that is true sometimes. Like sometimes professors or even deans or even presidents make mistakes. But one thing I've also learned as I've taken on different positions is that sometimes you don't know the full set of complexities that that person is dealing with in those roles. Um, a s short little example, so we have these teaching groups at the business school. So, you know, we teach by the case method, like the law school. And that means there's several professors, well, we have these large courses. Anyways, there's several professors teaching the same course. And we get together to discuss how we're going to teach these cases. And I remember as a new professor, we would teach a couple cases that I knew the year previously had not worked very well. Like, why in the world are we teaching this thing again? We only have 30 classes with our students. Why would we waste a session? Now I'm course head for one of those courses, and I realize we have a norm, which is that when a new professor writes a case, we leave it in the curriculum for two years. Right? So no matter what happens the first year, you leave it in. And it does have that cost. Sometimes it does not work very well. But it's the right norm for a couple reasons. It shows that we're committed to that junior professor, right? We're not throwing them under the bus. And it makes us work harder as a teaching group to figure out how to teach difficult cases and how to learn how to teach cases that don't work in an easy sort of way. So that's one of those things that as course head, you, you sort of see the rest of it that you wouldn't have seen underneath. And that's happened to me a thousand times at Harvard as I've been here for a long time. So to be clear, I'm not saying that university is perfect, right? If you see, if you see something, say something. Um, <laughs> But, but if you, and I mean, it's important, right? You might be the first one to spot the mistake. But I would just have you, I would urge you maybe to think while you're doing that, or as you're about to do it, that it could be that a hundred other of the brilliant people around you have also seen that, and they've mentioned it, but there's some constraint you haven't quite understood yet. Uh, and then that's why the university is, is doing what it does. So Larry said this, and I would just repeat it, everyone at this university wants your colleagues to succeed, your students to succeed, you to succeed, because that is the university, right? What is the faculty? The faculty is your colleagues, and it's you, and we're in the service of our students and our alumni, and so we all want to make this work together, and so I think it deserves our support and our constructive criticism and our trust. Thanks. I think I'm going to stand up here, too, because I can see only half of you. Um, great. Thanks for letting me go last. Um, so I guess I'm the most senior. I've been here, can you guys hear me? From, um, I've been here for about 12 years now. And as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm part of FAS, OEB, MCB, MCZ, HBI, CBS, <laughs> HHMI, and I serve on uh, CAP. So as you guys already probably figured out, the first challenge you're gonna have is figuring out all the acronyms at this place. It's incredible. I'm still figuring them um, all out myself. Um, I did want to uh, mention um, one thing that, uh, to reiterate what Elizabeth said, and that is um, I serve on CAP, and that's the Committee of Appointments and Promotions. And so um, I wanted to mention this for two reasons. Well, the first thing to say is that um, I'm really excited to see you here. So for those of you who um, came through tenure and are at FAS, I know a lot about you. Um, <laughs> I've read your files. I've uh, read some of your papers. Um, we've had discussions about you, um, and it's great to see your faces. For those of you who are on tenure track, at least through FAS, I look forward to seeing your dossiers in about eight years. <laughs> so this is one of the um, most fun committees that I've um, served on. I feel a lot of um, responsibility, and we take the, our jobs very seriously. But I just wanted to put at least one of the several faces behind that committee who makes decisions, or makes, sorry, we make no decisions. We make re recommendations uh, about tenures and promotion. Um, so just to see a face behind that committee, because I know when I first arrived here, um, I thought a lot about tenure, and I thought a lot about um, that process, and there were some mysterious steps along the way, and CAP was one of them. Um, so I was tasked with telling you um, a little bit about teaching and teaching resources here on campus. Um, so the first thing I'll say, um, wearing my um, CAP cap of cap, um, and that is that teaching has taken really seriously in terms of um, tenure and promotion. Um, and, and I don't think that's just lip service. I can say on the cap um, committee, uh, maybe half of the discussion for each person's dossier is really about the contributions to teaching. Um, and so it's something that I think it's good to hear early on and to really digest because I think that a lot of advice you get from people who went through tenure 20 years ago or people from the outside of Harvard, um, you'll hear, you know, it's all about research, but it's really about research and, and teaching. 
And on a more sort of um, happy note, not thinking about tenure, is um, I think this is a fantastic place to be a teacher because I think that um, within reason, you're really only limited by your imagination. Um, Harvard hired you for your creativity, not just in research, but also in teaching. And I like to think that you came here, chose to come here um, for this environment. There are a ton of resources available to help you with teaching. I am still learning about all of them, so I'm just going to mention a few. And again, this is really going to be FAS focused because that's my home. I just want to give you the um, perspective that I teach in a large introductory genetics course. I have between 300 and 400 freshmen. And I do want to reiterate the point that teaching <laughs> freshmen here is the best. <laughs> They're great, wide-eyed, super eager, um, excited, slightly freaked out. but. Um, <laughs> So the first um, resource I wanted to mention is the Box Center. Um, the Box Center is the place to go when you are thinking about teaching, um, when you want to kick off a new course, you have a project, even when you just have an idea. There are people literally waiting for you to come to them, and all they want to do is help. Um, they're great people to bounce ideas off of, talk about courses, designing new courses, syllabi, everything. They will help you with everything, and they can't wait to help you. They will also be of great help if you're struggling. So if you run your first course and it didn't go as smoothly as you expected, which happens a lot, um, they are there. They will come to your class. They will videotape you. They will make you watch that video. They will um, give you advice, um, et cetera. They will also help your students. So if you have a, maybe not a 300 person course, but you have a smaller course and you want the students to run projects, to make their own videos, to um, do hands-on projects, you can send them to the Box Center with, you have to get pre-approved of course, right? Send them to the Box Center and they will help them with those projects. Um, and then importantly, they also can help you with assessment. So learning about if you are doing a good job teaching, as good as you think you're doing, right? Um, so I just wanted to give you one quick example from um, the course that I was teaching in or have been teaching in for the last five years. And that is um, we decided that instead of having sort of review sessions, we would make um, videos, uh, two, three minute videos of difficult concepts, the concepts that students struggle with every term. And so we had this idea, we went to the box center, we said, is this a good idea? They worked with us and made it a better idea. Um, then uh, we were able to get money. So this is another point I wanted to um, uh, make is that there are pots of money um, around to uh, help you with teaching. So we use course innovation funds and I sent um, an email to the assistant dean of undergraduate education and we got some more money from a different pot to hire somebody who made these videos. But then what she wanted to do was turn making videos into um, a project in and of, of itself and then she recruited um, not only our teaching fellows but undergraduates who would test these videos. Uh, and now we have this library of 20 or so videos of these sort of difficult concepts. The really good ones we'll keep for next year. We'll make some new ones. This is now an idea that other courses are starting to adopt. And it's been just a super exciting and fun project that we could have, and I, cer I certainly couldn't have done on my own, but with the help of the Box Center, these little pots of money, and then lots of imagination and energy, um, it came to be. Another um, resource that I want to mention, and you probably already started getting emails from, is HILT, Harvard Initiative for Learning and Teaching. Got it? See, another acronym. Um, they run an annual uh, single day conference, usually in the fall, um, that has different topics. And so you'll hear some amazing uh, speakers that uh, specialize in how to teach, how to teach well. Um, and then usually we break out into small um, lunches and uh, little workshops and you can choose among a variety of topics that are most relevant to you. This is another great way to meet colleagues. Um, I've certainly met, met several colleagues through that. Um, and then HILT also um, funds projects. So if you have an idea, an innovative idea in terms of teaching, this is another way that you can get money to support that idea. Um, all of that said, I found that one of my most valuable resources in thinking about um, teaching is my colleagues. So uh, in the MCB department, Molecular and Cellular Biology department, we have a program in which colleagues come to your lectures, watch and provide feedback. 
Um, we do this on an optional basis if you're tenured. I did it. I got great feedback, um, even post-tenure, but we do it for all our tenure track faculty. It's a great way not only to get feedback and improve your courses, but you have um, your colleagues get to know you. Um, and when they write letters in support of your tenure, they have more to say than just your research. They can comment directly on your um, teaching as well. Uh, and one of the things that I learned from my colleagues that uh, I think was most uh, sort of exciting about teaching here is that uh, there's a great opportunity to be super creative. Um, you can do sort of whatever you want in terms of teaching. And so um, I just wanted to give you two quick examples of some courses that I developed when I first got here. Um, the first one I taught was a graduate level course on um, speciation, so how new species form. and um, this was a course that we were going to read uh, the primary literature. And so as we were thinking about this, we picked, I picked a couple of um, faculty and a couple of their papers from, a, from across the world, and we would talk about each one of those topics over the course of 12 weeks. And I started thinking about this, like running a journal club. Um, you know, the students would ask me questions like, well, why did they do the experiment this way? Or why did they choose that? Or why does this figure look like this? And I, I didn't actually know. Um, so what we decided to do was to Skype the professors. And so this is now um, not so um, new anymore. Lots of places do this. But 12 years ago when we first started doing this, it was a lot of fun. And I got a lot of support um, to do teaching in kind of a new way using video conferencing, right, to talk to the primary sources. Um, another example was um, that I'm a curator of mammals in the Natural History Museum here, and um, I had four freshmen knock on my door um, one day and say, hey, there's a course on birds, there's a course on herpetology, but there's no course on mammals. Let's have a course on mammals. And so we designed a course, and they designed the syllabus themselves. They um, had um, designed their own projects. And the end, the year, at the end of that uh, year, what we decided to do as our end of year project was go into the collections and actually revise all of the um, nomenclature for all of the species in the Great Mammal Hall, which I encourage you all to go see, uh, 26 Oxford Street. It's a rare gem on campus. Um, and uh, this was uh, a hands-on experience. They were out in the museum, and we actually had to mu move specimens because some of the systematic relationships actually changed um, since that was first installed. So it was a lot of fun. So I encourage you to be really creative, and I think that creativity is really um, valued here. Um, I think the main thing that I want to leave you with um, in terms of teaching is that for every problem, issue, question that you have, there is someone here to help you. And I think the big challenge is, is um, starting to learn um, where to find the right people to answer your questions. So they exist, um, and you just have to uh, find them. I think I'm not going to comment um, just so that there's time for questions on work-life balance. And I agree with um, everything that was said uh, previously. And it's worth um, putting in the time to figure out uh, your work-life balance now and getting good habits now because of the, the habits you're going to have 12 years later. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you again uh, to all of you.